step by step. Maurice was like, I need a white new edition. That's where the real money's at. Let's talk about it. Hi guys, welcome to the channel. If you like hearing stories from the 90s, subscribe. Let's get into it. Maurice Starr is an artist, producer and songwriter. Real name, Larry Johnson, going by the stage name Maurice. He was born in 1953 in Deland, Florida. His family moved to Boston, Massachusetts in the 70s to seek bigger and better things. It was a good move because that's where he met 10 talented kids who he would make stars. Maurice is from a musical family. His mother played organ in the church and his father was a trumpet player. One of six brothers, Maurice formed a band with his siblings and they became the Johnson brothers. They had hoped to become the next Jackson 5, but perhaps it was a little too soon for another Jackson 5. Just 10 years old at the time, Maurice toured all over the state of Florida with his brothers. They were certainly known locally, but they failed to break out nationally and beyond. So when Maurice was 17 years old, his family picked up and left and moved to Boston. Maybe they had hoped moving to a bigger city would help their careers. In 1980, Larry started going by the name Maurice Starr, and he actually ended up recording two solo albums. In his early 20s, he managed to land two deals, first with Arista and then with RCA. That would have been quite an accomplishment back then, considering how hard it was to even get one deal. But because neither album sold particularly well, he ended up losing those deals. And at this point, he said he wanted to leave the industry. When I was a little boy, the dream was for me to be a star. As I kept going through the business and getting knocked back down, I saw that it wasn't as nice as I thought it was. I almost left the music business at 17. His talent certainly got him the deals, but sometimes not all the components are in place to find success at that particular time. One night, Maurice was asked to fill in for a judge who was sick for a local talent show in what he calls a hole in the wall club in Boston. They offered him 20 bucks for the gig and because he was broke, he reluctantly agreed. He saw a ton of kid acts, some dressed in suits, mimicking grown people's music. Some of the kids lip synced to Jackson 5 songs. Then Maurice got an idea. He thought this could be huge. I said, man, if I could take one of these groups and put them out there, they would be big. So Maurice began hosting his own talent shows. In Bobby Brown's book, Every Little Step, you know I love that book. He said, I entered a talent show at a local club called The Hi Hat in Roxbury, the predominantly black neighborhood in Southern Boston, where Orchard Park was located. In fact, I did so well, I scared the hell out of myself. He said Boston kids in the 80s grew up fast, in retrospect, too fast. When we were still in elementary school, no more than 11 or 12, we had the freedom to roam the streets. Of course, that meant we were always just the half second of trouble, just inches away from a squad car. But we also had the space to explore the things that interested us. For me, of course, it was dancing and music. So after his first talent show win, that's all Bobby wanted to do. He would rehearse and prepare for each show. It gave him something positive to focus on. So it was at one talent show where he met Maurice. After singing the song La 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 by the Delphonics, Bobby came in at second place, but Maurice was still impressed. So Maurice approached Bobby after the show. Bobby was aware of who he was. He was known as the local talent whose career didn't quite take off. Maurice told Bobby to go and find some other kids who could dance and sing background to accompany him. The first person Bobby approached was Michael Bivens. He and Michael were actually in a dance troupe together, so he knew Michael could sing and dance. Next, he approached Ralph Tresvent and Ricky Bell. They were actually in a duo together. And in that moment, new addition was born. They actually had another guy called Travis in mind, but Travis was away for the summer. So it's kind of unfortunate for him. 
So literally the following night was going to be their big break where they performed as a group for the first time. And that would be the first time Maurice would see them perform together. With Michael Jackson blowing up the charts as a solo artist, all the kids wanted to sound like Michael and they all emulated him with their singing. So when they first got together to prepare for the talent show, at that point they knew they were onto something very special. Bobby was set to be the lead singer and he really thought he sounded like Michael until he heard Ralph sing. Bobby was happy to take a step back and let Ralph be the lead singer. He knew he could contribute in other ways as he was the strongest dancer in the group. So they performed at the hi-hat and Maurice heard them sing for the first time together. He said their sound was a little bit off, but he saw great potential. Speaking of Ralph, he said, I thought, man, if I could put that little boy in tune. The boys actually lost the talent show. They came in second. The first prize was a record deal. They lost to some lanky rappers who we've never heard of since. Despite losing, Maurice still wanted to work with the boys and pursue a record deal. And Maurice introduced the fifth member to the group, Ronnie DeVoe. They were in the studio right away and Maurice already had them recording songs. So Maurice wrote the songs, he played the instruments at the studio sessions and he orchestrated everything. I had a meeting with them and said, I'm taking this whole thing over. I'm gonna navigate it. I'm gonna create the whole picture. And everybody said, okay. They didn't have much luck with the major labels. So they ended up getting signed to an independent label that was based in New York City. So they got signed to Streetwise Records and began working on their debut album. Their debut album, Candy Girl, was released in 1983, just shortly after Bobby's 14th birthday. So Maurice was still managing everything, even telling the boys what to say in interviews. He said that they kind of got sick of him doing everything after a while. But the boys also took initiative at their young age. They actually approached a local choreographer, Brooke Payne, because they wanted to improve their moves. Brooke was more than willing to work with them and he had them practicing every day and it paid off big time. Bobby explained that they unexpectedly heard their song on the radio for WRBB. People in the neighborhood were blasting the song and of course they were ecstatic, but nobody even told them that their song was gonna be on the radio. They soon heard the song on bigger radio stations such as Kiss FM. At this point, they hadn't even signed a contract. Then he said their parents started to demand answers, especially Bobby's mother. But unfortunately, they still ended up getting ripped off. At a later stage, they realized that it wasn't actually Maurice's fault, but at the time, they blamed him. Candy Girl reached number one in the US R&B charts and reached number one in the UK singles charts. There are various reports that indicate how much or how little the boys got paid around this time. Bobby said after the album Candy Girl blew up and the single reached top 10 in several different countries, they each received $500 and a VCR so they could watch themselves on TV. He said he knew it was effed up, but they were kids, so they were still happy. They used their earnings to buy mopeds, not realizing that they needed licenses to ride them on the road and they ended up getting arrested. After surviving jail, they went off on a tour of the UK and Germany, going overseas for the first time in their lives. And Bobby said the boys hated every minute of it. We were just little kids from the projects, not open-minded enough to be able to enjoy different foods and cultures. So just after two days in London, they got very sick from the food. Maybe they had some blood pudding with their English breakfast or a dodgy scotch egg. He said they searched for a McDonald's to find something familiar. <laughs> you would think they were dropped off in the mountains of the Himalayas with nothing but yak meat to eat. But Ralph got so sick that he wasn't able to perform on top of the pops, which was a really popular show in the UK back then. So Bobby had to take his place. And he said that his stomach was really temperamental while he was performing, but he got through it. His new edition, I'm Candy Girl. All that dancing and jumping around couldn't have been good for his stomach. According to the book, The Song Machine, 
inside the hip factory. The author claims that the boys actually only earned $1.87 in royalties. This was attributed to expenses and the tour budget. And in the Town Talk interview, it was revealed that Maurice received $61,000 in record royalties from their debut album. And the group received $41,000, which obviously would have been divided by five. So the amount may not have been profit for the boys since the expenses were then deducted from everything. And that might explain why there was only like $500 each or even less. The boys obviously felt like they were being ripped off and had little money to show for all their hard work. They were actually touring around the country and getting dropped off in the early hours of the morning and going to school the following day. So they were really working hard at such a young age and they probably felt that the rewards weren't matching their hard work. So they decided to find new management and unfortunately this caused them to get ripped off even more. Bobby said they had had enough and they found some white managers as he puts it and the company was called Jump and Shoot. Then they ended up getting signed to MCA Records but they later found out that they weren't actually signed to MCA. They were signed to the management company Jump and Shoot. So Jump and Shoot were basically able to pay them whatever they wanted to. They weren't receiving royalties, essentially. In response to getting dropped as their manager, Maurice said, when people get a hit record, they lose their minds. But I don't think it was a case of them, you know, having the success go to their head. I think they just wanted to get paid a decent amount of money for what they were doing. And they felt that they weren't getting that under Maurice, unfortunately. New Edition went on to release six more albums and then we got Bobby Brown with his solo career and Belle Bib DeVoe, hits after hits. So New Edition went on to change the face of R&B and New Jack Swing and paved the way for so many other artists. Boys to Men were discovered by Michael Bivens. It's no surprise that New Edition were inducted into the Hollywood Walk of Fame. On June the 28th, 2016, they received their star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame for their contributions to the music industry. New Edition were inducted into the Black Music and Entertainment Walk of Fame. And they're still touring till this day, still going strong, still dancing and singing live, getting up there, doing their thing. And they performed with New Kids on the Block at the American Music Awards in the Battle for Boston segment. Another group who they paved the way for with him no longer managing New Edition, Maurice came up with a new plan for another boy group. He said New Edition mainly appealed to black audiences and even had some resistance from white audiences. So he decided to form a white version of New Edition to reach a wider audience. An old video I did was about the Grammys removing the urban category. I spoke about the discussion that they were having at the time where they said that the term R&B can actually hold back a black artist as it appeals and is targeted towards a smaller group, whereas the term pop reaches a wider audience. There was an article in Rolling Stone that argued that black artists are automatically put into the R&B category, whereas a white artist singing R&B is automatically put into a pop category. They're automatically marketed to a wider audience, therefore selling more albums, making more money and having an advantage over their black counterparts. Elvis's song, Hound Dog, was a classic example of this. The original singer barely sold anywhere near the amount that Elvis sold doing a cover of her song. Then on top of that, some black artists get accused of not being black enough by certain record labels and also within their community. Whitney Houston had to deal with that, for instance, and that was something that she really struggled with as an artist. But everybody loved her voice, regardless of their background. When she sang, everyone listened, and she was known as The Voice. Then Kim Hill, who was originally in Black Eyed Peas, spoke about having the same issue. Her record company didn't quite know what to do with her, apparently. Even though she left the Black Eyed Peas, because they were going down more of a commercial route. As the Peas began their chart-topping reign, Kim was signed to a solo deal with major label Interscope, but was dropped for not being, quote, black enough. 
If Justin Timberlake is considered an urban artist and I still have to sit in meetings and they go, your music's not black enough, there's a problem. There's a real state of emergency in music. And Justin Bieber also made it clear that the album he released a couple of years ago was very much R&B. Kalani released her album in 2020. On Instagram, she wrote, it was good until it wasn't, link in bio. Last day to stream to get the first strictly R&B first week number one album in a long time. Our genre isn't dead. And Justin hijacked the post to say that Changes was in fact an R&B album and that album went to number one. Some fans didn't agree. Others just thought it was rude for him to post that. The album was listed as an R&B album. We do tend to make race a factor when it comes to these matters. So unlike New Edition, who were friends and knew each other from their local area, New Kids on the Block were put together via auditions. Three of them knew each other, but had never performed together. Auditions were held in Dorchester, a working class, predominantly white area of Boston. Apparently, New Edition asked Maurice to return as manager, but by that time, he was already too busy with New Kids on the Block. Maurice was more concerned about the overall image of the group and their ability to perform and entertain. He wasn't too hung up on whether they could sing or not, because he believed that you could teach that. Maurice famously said, if New Edition was as big as they were, I could imagine what would happen if white kids were doing the same thing. So the first person who they found was Donny Wahlberg. Donny actually rapped and said that he did his best spontaneous rap for him. And he was impressed, so he recruited him first. Donny had, he was very spontaneous. He could, he could rap and never stop. I said, can you rap? He said, sure. He said, I'll make up a rap about you. He said, you're a Maurice star and you're number one. He just kept going. So Donny got his brother Mark to also join the group. And then he had two friends, Jamie Kelly and Jordan Knight. Jordan demonstrated his singing and dancing talent. And he also had an older brother who of course didn't want to be left out. So Jordan's brother, Jonathan, joins the group. And the last person to join the group was Danny Wood. He was a good break dancer. So they weren't called New Kids on the Block. They were first called Nanook, <laughs> spelled N-Y-N-U-K. For some reason, Maurice wanted that to be their name, but the record company hated it, understandably. Maurice wanted them to basically sound black and they would do vocal training, rehearsals every day. He really put them to work to make sure that they were prepared to go on the road. So when Donny, Jordan and Danny were in elementary school, they were actually bussed out of Dorchester to another school. This was in an attempt to desegregate the schools in Boston. In compliance with the 1965 Racial Imbalance Act, Boston schools had to desegregate. Students from either predominantly white or predominantly black areas of the city were bused to different schools outside of their areas. Outside of school, it was a very controversial time. We were surrounded by chaos. But in school, it was amazing. We didn't feel all that. Everyone was open to being around everyone else. Donnie said, they intended to bring people together, to learn about each other and to be exposed to different things. And that's what happened to us. So the boys were introduced to new music and new walks of life. They were comfortable traveling around Maurice's neighborhood. They went there every day to visit his studio and to rehearse. They said having a black producer, songwriter and choreographer really set them apart. But just after a couple of months, Mark Wahlberg decided to leave the group. Donnie said that he was actually going through a bad phase. He was either stealing cars or playing basketball, but he left to pursue a solo career a career that Donnie would actually help him with. Jamie Kelly also left the group early on due to a lack of commitment or a lack of talent. Six members would have been too much anyway, but then they were down to four and Maurice believed they needed a fifth member, so they held auditions again. So Maurice's business partner, Mary Alford, who actually helped him put the group together, was able to find Joey McIntyre. Joey was just 12 at the time, and he lived a little bit further out in Jamaica Plain. 
Joey liked to perform in local theatres and when he auditioned, he sang Nat King Cole's Love. Of course, they wanted him to join the group, but he was actually reluctant because he was younger than the others and was kind of like an outsider. He lived in Jamaica Plain and the others were friends. So he kind of felt intimidated by that. In the end, he agreed to join the group because he was a fan of New Edition and knew about Maurice. But poor Joey wanted to leave soon after joining because he was given quite a hard time by the other members. But Donny persuaded him to stay. So they rehearsed like crazy and would perform in any venue that would have them. Talent shows, which was Maurice's specialty, nursing homes, theatres, social halls. They even performed at a prison where one of the Wahlberg brothers was incarcerated. They gave the inmates cigarettes to win over the crowd. Still called Nanook at this time, they performed at the Franklin Park Kite Festival. They were booed and things were thrown at them on stage. Jordan even ended up with a cut on his face. Tough crowd. They were basically run off stage, but instead of giving up, they actually returned to finish their performance. And that won the crowd over. The crowd actually started cheering after that. And, you know, they saw that they had a lot of heart. So they respected them. Going back on stage was simply about us believing in ourselves and wanting to stand our ground. And even the greatest singers of all time have been booed. Then in 1986, New Kids on the Block, or Nanook, got their big break by getting signed to the R&B division of Columbia Records. So it's official, they were R&B. Although having such divisions has actually been criticised in recent years, because it kind of pigeonholes certain artists and markets them to a smaller audience, it's believed. But these divisions were actually set up specifically to give black artists a chance within the industry. Some record companies even labelled it the Black Music Division. In the book, Hip Hop America, author Nelson George writes, In essence, they were established to employ African Americans to sell black popular music within their community and identify performers with crossover appeal. In terms of employment opportunities, salaries and advances paid to artists, this was an important development worth celebrating. So New Kids on the Block were officially considered R&B and their manager, writer and producer Maurice was essentially a black artist himself and he was able to get them signed to the R&B division. This may not have been possible if no such division existed. And of course, the label were like, you've got to change the name. So they became New Kids on the Block and that name was inspired by a rap song that Donnie had written of the same name. So their first self-titled album was released in 1986 and they were actually presented to black audiences first, hoping to win them over before trying to appeal to a wider audience. This failed miserably and the first album flopped. So Maurice was determined that this wasn't gonna happen again. He started canvassing radio stations, getting them to play their music. And he wanted to film a music video for the boys he asked the record company for $15,000 and they declined. So he borrowed money from his mother and various other sources to come up with the money for himself. He even had to pay for the flights of the music executives to fly them to Boston to see the premiere of the video. I had borrowed money from so many places. I was down to my last pennies. I mean, I wasn't down to my last pennies. I was down to some other people's last pennies. So they started working on their second album in 1987 and Maurice felt that their first album sounded too much like bubblegum pop so he really wanted to move away from that. The second album was recorded in Maurice's home studio which didn't even have soundproofing or any fancy equipment. Maurice was still the predominant writer but the boys had grown in confidence so added their own personal touches. And in 1998, Hangin' Tough was released. Marie still wanted them to target black audiences and Please Don't Go Girl came out on BET and various radio stations that Maurice was familiar with from the new edition days. They were about to get dropped until a Florida radio station started playing Please Don't Go Girl 
As soon as it was played on this radio station, New Kids on the Block began to build a fan base and the record company took notice. The record company decided to keep the group. After they received such a positive response, the song became the most requested song on the radio station's playlist. Maurice told them that if they keep working hard, it will work out. They made appearances on Soul Train and Showtime at the Apollo, and they got to open for Tiffany, a popular singer in the late 80s, early 90s. And remember, there was no social media at this time, so building a fan base was a lot harder. It was all done through being on the radio, being on TV, being in magazines, and just showing up. Sales of the album Hangin' Tough began to grow, and then their second single was released, one of their most famous singles. You've Got It, The Right Stuff was played over and over again on MTV and it reached top 10 in several different countries and five on Billboard. They were scheduled to open for Tiffany again, but by this time the group had become so popular that the tables had turned and she ended up opening for them. By 1990, New Kids on the Block had become one of the most popular groups in the US. Their third album, Step by Step, was released and by this time, the guys started to flex their songwriting muscles. Over half of the songs on the album were produced and written by them. Their single of the same name went straight to number one and became their biggest selling single. The second song, Tonight, was their ninth consecutive top 10 single. The album went triple platinum, selling 20 million copies worldwide. Their fan club was the largest fan club in the country with over 200,000 members. The Magic Summer Tour grossed over $74 million. 3.2 million people were believed to have attended that tour and Forbes named New Kids on the Block the highest paid earners in the music industry, beating Michael Jackson, Prince and Madonna that year. Their merch was believed to have grossed over 400 million in sales, lunch boxes, t-shirts, comic books, action figures, cartoons, and their hotline received 100,000 calls per week. Remember, there was no internet, so that's all we had. And in the meantime, Mark Wahlberg had launched his career in the music industry. Marky Mark and the Funky Bunch released their album, which was produced by Donnie Wahlberg. Their debut single, Good Vibrations, went to number one. New Kids on the Block did have some setbacks though. Towards the end of this streak, within the 90s, they did have to compete with different genres, such as gangster rap, and basically music going in a whole new different direction. But one major setback was the whole lip syncing scandal. Gregory McPherson, who helped produce Step by Step and was a music teacher at Berklee College of Music, alleged that Marie Starr sang the vocals and the group lip synced to pre-recorded tracks. He kind of implied that they were doing a mini Vellini New Kids were on tour in Australia at the time, when all these allegations surfaced. They decided they had to address it, so they flew back to the only place where this score was going to be settled, the Arsenio Hall Show. Any artist who performs on this show has to perform live. That's how it's all set up. So they performed to a medley of their songs for a five minute segment, even changing the lyrics here and there to prove they were singing live and some of the lyrics included some swear words. The group interrupted a tour of Australia to perform again on the Arsenio Hall show to try to prove once and for all that they do their own singing. We guarantee you there is no lip syncing in our show. In the band. McPherson lodged a $75 million lawsuit and claimed that New Kids on the Block and Maurice, I guess, had defrauded their fans. He said New Kids sang less than 40% of the lead vocals and that it was mainly sung by his brother Michael and Maurice. And maybe uh, 20 percent in some instances, maybe a little more in other instances, and maybe a little less. Maurice denied this and said that the group always sang their lead vocals. McPherson had been fired as one of the producers, so he was claiming royalties as part of the lawsuit too. In 1992, New Kids fought back and sued McPherson for defamation. He recanted his claims and the lawsuits were dropped. It came out that Maurice's voice was used for some of the vocals on the backing tracks as part of the harmonies. As he's a singer, it's natural that he would want to contribute some of his vocals, I think. I don't think it's a big deal. 
Maurice played instruments for the studio sessions and I can imagine that he would naturally want to offer his vocals as well. And, you know, just as Puffy likes to dance, be all up in the videos, Maurice too likes to sing and offer his vocals whenever he can as well. And also when artists are singing and dancing at the same time and they're doing that live, it's not out of the ordinary for, you know, background vocals to be playing on a track. When you're singing and dancing at the same time, you're going to get out of breath, no matter how fit you are. Hi. So I don't see a problem with them playing the chorus on a track and just ad-libbing rather than trying to sing the way they sing in a studio where they're just standing there and not exerting themselves. It's not going to sound the same, obviously. I heard one of the guys say I sang the wrong part in a harmony situation the first time they were here. That's live, real music, you know? That's the way it is. It ain't perfect. And we know that lip syncing is not considered a big deal now. Artists do it all the time. I personally don't like it, but it's not a scandal. I mean, they, they lip sync to the lead vocals too, not just, not just the chorus now these days. It depends on the show. It depends on where they're performing. Some places don't have the equipment for live performances. It's not like Milli Vanilli where they misrepresented their voices. When we hear New Kids on the Block, we know that's their voice. It's, it's not Maurice, he's only one person. So, you know, it's clearly it's them singing. When New Kids filed their lawsuit against McPherson, Jordan called it a vendetta and said that they just want to get him. And Joe McIntyre said that McPherson was simply after money. But what really made us mad was that when the truth finally came out, it barely got reported. Everybody jumped on the bandwagon with all the negative stuff about how we didn't sing. But nobody did any stories saying the guy who spread all these lies admitted he was a fraud. Nobody printed any big headlines like the new kids really do sing. But hey, that's the way the media works. It's not about truth. It's about controversy. And then nothing's changed. Maurice also went on to manage Perfect Gentleman, Rick West and NK5. But without a doubt, his biggest groups were New Edition and New Kids on the Block. New Kids on the Block were reunited with Maurice recently in Charleston, North Carolina. Maurice was said to be in great spirits and was eager to reunite with them. Sadly, in 2015, Maurice had a stroke, which he is currently still recovering from. Maurice's nephew, Bobby, said he was, quote, determined to meet up and reunite with five guys from Boston, whom he loves tremendously. The last time they were together was in July 2019, when Maurice was honoured by his hometown, Dillon, Florida, on Black History Month for his contribution to the arts as a musician, songwriter and producer. Their most recent reunion last week was said to be a touching one where Joey McIntyre even sang for Maurice. The two groups came together last year, great to see them performing together and still have a lot of energy, still singing live, still dancing, singing at the same time. Here's all you need to know about New Edition. Yeah. If there was no New Edition, there would be no New Kids on the Block, yeah. no Boys to Men, yeah, yeah. no Backstreet Boys, no NSYNC, no Old Town, no One Direction, no LFO, no nothing. And all of it was possible because of Maurice. Thanks for watching. Share your thoughts below, you know I read the comments. Like and subscribe for weekly videos. And don't forget to click the bell for more.